Chapter 90 of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers by Simon Landis. Chapter 90 Dr. Juno's Great Defiant Defense mr president and gentlemen of the commission as i am privileged to defend myself permit me in the onset of my remarks to say that i shall not appear before you as a whining coward nor shall i seek favors at your hands you have not proved anything against me upon which according to stereotyped orthodox usages you could find a verdict of guilty against me for murder in any degree but i emphatically acknowledge that i have ordered all your men to be shot dead who were taken prisoners and who would not take our oath of allegiance and fight in our army and navy against you after i exhorted them to do so and i gave them an opportunity to defend themselves hisses and groans i am aware that this course of warfare is looked upon by all nations as outrageous but i am not controlled or guided by the public opinion of this or any other nation simply because this and every nation on the globe are governed by customs or habits whatever is a custom or usage finally becomes a law custom makes law whether such custom is founded upon fixed law or god's law or upon conjecture and the result of this habit of allowing customs to create law for a nation proves to have been and still is the ruination of the people the working people the poor people the fallen people for whose welfare and eternal salvation i have lived and labored through calm and storm for many long years regardless of comfort gain glory of men or the favor of the pharisees themselves to me war is always outrageous and therefore as we must have this outrageous evil as a necessity the severer the blow the sooner will it be ended it is quadruply outrageous to protract war to make it a lingering cruelty carrying it on for years until a nation is ruined in every way and finally closing the conflict without having established a sound public doctrine or without having taught the belligerents that it was caused by unfaithfulness to god's hallowed injunctions without teaching the nation or nations that jesus christ was a naturalist who taught us by precept and example that the poor man's soul is as near and dear to him as the rich person's yea he went farther and said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of god jesus meant what he said for it is utterly impossible for a man to be happy in the hereafter when this mortal coil returns to clay and the spirit stands aloof and reflects upon the impiousness of having held as his own that which he neither brought into the world nor took out of it and which god designed for the use of all alike whilst they journeyed on his footstool where the most talented apt and wise should do but do not as christ commanded preach saying that the kingdom of god is at hand meaning all the fixed laws and wonderful works of god heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead cast out devils freely ye have received freely give provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses i have by acts followed these natural teachings all my life and you and your co-conspirators who have worshipped god contrary to this scientific method have persecuted me and mine for nearly half a century until you became so cruel tyrannical overbearing selfish and self-righteous that neither i nor my followers could exist in peace and comfort therefore we saw that it behooved us to teach you a terrible lesson and by so doing save the unborn generations from falling into the same horrible pool of corruption that nations have waited in for hundreds of years thus i have instituted the most speedy although cruel plan to save the race from the thraldom that filthy lucre creates and thereby give to the poor a chance to be honest healthy and natural great applause 
do i look like a man fond of war who would delight in the misery of the people i hope not do i look like the man that the honourable bluster gibbons has made me out to be cries of no no do any of my sermons lectures orations or writings advocate cruelty to the people or have i always advocated that the few should be sacrificed for the good of the many cries of yes what induced me to oppose the whole world but my unfeigned love for the people and the practical reverence i had for god war is always cruel and thousands of innocent ones must suffer for the guilty in such outrageous times but the right always conquers in the end it was such men as yourselves yes you and your proselytes that have caused this barbarous conflict and it is i who had shot and intend to have all your rebellious men speedily shot when taken as prisoners and if i die at your hands generals cadwell stew pansy and pierce die also such have been my orders however i feel that it would be best for my cause if you should shoot me therefore i resolutely and fearlessly defy you to shoot me cries of hear hear if i should fall at your hands it would cause such a holy indignation throughout the union amongst the sovereign people the working people whom the honourable bluster gibbons styles the offscouring of the land who are not good enough for you to wipe your feet upon that they would wipe you out like slate pencil marks yes i am fully convinced that i had better die at your hands so find me guilty of anything and vent your hypocritical spleen upon him who has been a stumbling block in your unhallowed path and then you will see the glory of god appear tremendous applause i speak this gentlemen with reverence and in great earnestness and now as i have given you a brief explanation of the motives that prompted me to shoot your men i will add that i esteem you gentlemen and your boon associates not these spectators who are twin to our offscouring of the land as the most impious black-hearted and dastardly set of hypocrites and vipers that the world ever looked upon you have had your own way so long that you think it presumptuous in any man or body of men to throw you from your sacrilegious saddle in which you have been riding to the devil on the double quick and have dragged the millions of sincere and confiding working people with you deny this if you can and more you have owned everything you have stolen the livery of heaven to serve the devil in have by your selfishness usurped every right of the people when i say the people i mean the working people the producers the offscouring of the land who are not good enough to wipe your pharisaical feet upon tremendous applause i gentlemen have the honour of having caused your little game to be permanently blocked and even your own people these your spectators seem to approve of my course if i may judge of the kindly applause that i have received since i have feebly spoken in defence of their rights at the sacrifice of your lofty positions positions which you have obtained by cunning craft and deception which very much looks to me like legalized wholesale robbery like selling principle and piety to the highest bidder and which resembles the graphic picture which is painted in the twenty-third chapter of st matthew of the new testament in the language of the son of man who likewise gave himself as a sacrifice or ransom for the cause of god and humanity that is woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte and when he is made ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves ye serpents ye generation of vipers how can ye escape the damnation of hell behold your house is left unto you desolate in conclusion let me invoke you to repent every one of you and join our cause of god and humanity that the spirit of christ and the reappearing or second coming of christ may be made manifest uproarious applause but if you refuse to accept the bona fide boon of salvation and persist in your haughty manner to usurp the power which alone is vested in god and his faithful people 
you will shortly receive your doom mark the words of one who is your friend however abrupt and cruel his language may seem vociferous applause i have done and it remains for you to do as you see fit in either way i will be benefited may god have mercy on your souls End of chapter 90chapter ninety one of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety one the verdict and its effect after the close of dr juno's speech the spectators were all removed, as well as Dr. Juno, when the following wrangling discussion between the gentlemen of the commission took place. "'Well, gentlemen,' said the president, General Orthod, "'I scarcely know what we had better do with this bold man. If we find him guilty of murder in the first degree, as we ought, and sentence him to be shot, we may prove to be our own worst enemies.' for assuredly it will cause a mutiny in our ranks which was plainly to be seen when juno made that daredevil speech he is certainly a great bold and heroic man and i rather admire him i feel that we had better acquit him on the ground that the testimony was not sufficient to convict him but i am ready to hear your opinions gentlemen i am astonished thunderstruck at the remarks of our general and president of this court-martial ejaculated colonel fury stuck up we must strike a fearless blow now or become the laughing-stock of the whole civilized world if mutiny riot and internal rebellion are to come now is the time to let them come because the enemy is well nigh used up and cannot take the aggressive for a long time whilst we can easily subdue the few giddy-headed rioters who were psychologized by Juno's blustering sophistry, and who will as soon yield to our commands as they applauded this arch-fiend. Again, once Juno is dead, we will be master of the post, for his like does not exist. And as regards the testimony not being sufficient is nonsense. Did he not boldly plead guilty? And after his speech will reach the masses of our people— would they not spurn us and denounce us as cowards and cutthroats were we to acquit him no gentlemen he must be sentenced to death and to-morrow he should be shot for my part said colonel windy i agree with colonel stuckup this man must die as soon as possible i would myself feel disposed to assassinate him if he were acquitted therefore i am for speedy work let the consequence be what it may I call for the vote of the commission. I second that motion, interposed Colonel Stuckup, who was terribly elated and stuck up over the apparent victory his speech had over General Orthod's wise remarks. I would like to make a few remarks before action is taken in this very important matter, responded Brigadier General Longhead. I perfectly agree with our wise, experienced, and eminent president, who can see farther than these young men, who probably are moved more by passion than discretion. This man, Dr. Juno, has made a wonderful and lasting impression upon our own fighting men, upon whom we must depend for victory, and if we sentence this fearless creature, they will murder us. I saw a phonographic reporter take down the whole proceedings, and a friend of mine whispered to me, during the time Juno was speaking, that compositors were then at work setting up the same for publication in pamphlets and their distribution amongst the army navy and the people will be self-evident the result you will see if we convict this man in sooth we may be executed by our own men before juno if we find him guilty we have made a great blunder in having allowed the people to be present in the trial and the honourable bluster gibbons's remarks about the working people were a stab into our own sides i will vote against conviction i call now for the vote ejaculated colonel windy 
no sir first give me a moment to answer general longhead according to his folly interrupted colonel stuckup you talk like a man who is about turning traitor or like a scared boy or a villain sir to whom do you address your ungentlemanly and illy timed remarks interrupted the president general orthod if you speak of general longhead you yourself are guilty of the charges with which you would brand this wise superior officer and i emphatically command you to make an apology to him or i shall order your arrest i did speak of general longhead responded colonel stuckup but his foolish speech made me too indignant to hold my tongue and i only make an apology by the order of our president and superior officer under any other circumstances i should resent the proposition and challenge discussion to the death your apology is accepted but in the future guard your stuck-up tongue as becomes a subordinate young officer when your words may be heeded said general orthod in a firm and polite manner he knew that this was not the place and time for bantering words but he wanted peace in his commission until the verdict was rendered there were twenty-four men in this commission nearly all were rabid orthodox conspirators except generals orthod and longhead therefore the wise remarks of these sages were not heeded and as the votes were called for without any objections twenty-one were cast for conviction and three for acquittal it was now eight o'clock in the evening and when the verdict was made public a rush by the people was made for the court-room where the commission had convened but the members of the court-martial had all left except colonel stuckup and windy who were addressing some of their friends on the fight and fuss they had with generals orthod and longhead the mob forced its way rudely into the midst of the room and cried tumultuously where are the members of the commission colonel stuckup jumped upon a table and violently called for attention and said fellow citizens colonel windy and myself are the only members in the house the rest have left groans we have worked hard to render a verdict of guilty hisses please permit me to acquaint you with a dastardly outrage groans and a move to lynch them keep silent for only a moment when you will hear who are your best friends and who your enemies cries go on go on and hurry up would you think it generals orthod and longhead did their best to acquit juno good go on quick but the colonel here and myself made strong speeches for conviction and the rest you know no sooner had these remarks been made when these two colonels were seized and dragged into the street where ropes were furnished and they were hung to the nearest trees and their swords were taken from them by the rioters who stabbed them dozens of times into their abdomens with deadly violence when the mob saw that their victims were dying they pinned printed black cards upon their bodies which were previously prepared with these words upon them the work of the greasy dirty mechanics the offscouring of the land and friends of dr juno the mob now moved for the honorable bluster gibbons's residence but they were disbanded before they went to square by the regulars who were ordered to fire upon and arrest them still this did not remove the perturbed spirit that had invested the minds of the working people the very people who fought against their own interest which was indelibly inscribed upon their minds by that great speech of dr juno which even the entire army and navy of this people had read by this time and which was fomenting the feelings of these hired soldiers and marines to a fever heat general orthod was appealed to by the citizens to issue a proclamation which would check this internal rebellion this threatened mutiny but he said i have advised the two young men colonels stuckup and windy who were lynched by the mob i told them and so did our prudent general longhead that our own people might become our executioners if we should find dr juno guilty but they spurned our advice and found him guilty and what is still worse is they have sentenced him to be shot to-morrow at ten o'clock in the morning 
which will cause a terrible scene of bloodshed i am fully persuaded that we are lost utterly lost by following the programme of the commission i have done my best so has generals longhead and wisdom who were the only members that opposed conviction all the rest were for it but general responded a parson do you not suppose that a judiciously executed proclamation would put a stop to this fearful rioting offer them good will if obedient and summary death if disobedient to your orders i will do my duty said he when he speedily wrote the following proclamation it is my duty to issue this proclamation which grieves me to the heart first all rioters or those who incite to riot shall be shot on the spot secondly i will do everything as i always have done to benefit our cause and our people but riot in our own family divides the house when it may fall which might encourage the prostrated foe sufficiently to rally his forces and continue the war after juno is shot thirdly the soldiers and citizens will heed and execute this proclamation given at headquarters in the army of the union this blank day of blank nineteen blank by orthod end of chapter ninety one chapter ninety two of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety two the shooting of dr juno and the last battle the evening when the verdict against dr juno was published to the conspirators army at precisely the same hour when the naturalists army began to move toward the enemy the naturalists received the news half an hour later and this caused a vehement double quick march for the scene that was to take place the following morning at ten o'clock lucinda telegraphed to her entire army navy and people to make tremendous haste and strike vehemently as they the conspirators had internal trouble which might postpone the execution of her beloved victor the enemy was informed that the naturalists were moving rapidly upon him but this kind of news was not believed by the officers of the conspirators hence they gave themselves no uneasiness in that direction however they feared their own people and the only thing they cared about this report was that it might embolden their soldiers and encourage them in their mutiny general orthod's proclamation was published in the morning papers and by circulars which created a determination against the officers to execute it and frighten the people if possible but the majority of the men of their army that was in that place were only waiting for a time to show their determination and although their fortifications were very strong and a few men could hold an immense force in abeyance still all this would avail nothing on this momentous occasion at eight o'clock in the morning the conspirators had to believe to their sorrow that the army of the naturalists was approaching because their pickets were driven in from all sides who reported that an immense army was besieging them when general orthod ordered the men into the forts but hundreds of them were intoxicated even many of the officers had too much gas on their brains to attend to their duty they had their hands more than full as dr juno must be shot peremptorily at ten o'clock which would be an hour of sore distress because the enemy would be upon them the execution of juno might cause riot and mutiny in their own ranks and what to do was a puzzle to the leading generals in command of the troops time was brief and the rattling of musketry and clattering of wagons and horses hoofs were audibly heard in the distance the fray was ready to begin and the planting of huge cannon all around the conspirators forts seemed to be the work of a minute when shells and hot shot fairly rained upon the fortifications and camps of the conspirators which made awful havoc 
thousands were shattered to atoms by the fierceness of bursting shells and truly the hour of terror had arrived being now ten minutes of ten o'clock when the officers who were ordered to execute dr juno speedily selected fifty soldiers to prepare to shoot him dr juno was brought into an open space of the main fort and the men were commanded to aim and fire which they did but instead of hitting juno they from some cause or other missed him which amazed and almost paralyzed the officers who were now becoming superstitious believing that this man's life was a charmed one this however was not the case but the soldiers aimed two or three inches higher than his head this was a settled matter amongst the soldiers that whoever would be selected to shoot dr juno should aim too high and should any one of them prove false the rest should shoot him on the instant dr juno saw that the officers were affrighted whilst the soldiers seemed to evince a desire to have juno command them when he made one leap for the musket of a soldier who had his piece ready loaded to fire and cried aloud in a commanding manner soldiers obey my orders and shoot down every officer and man who fights any longer against the working people in an instant every officer in that large fort fell dead and the white flag was run up when the naturalists took possession of the strongest fortification general armington commanded this division and as he stepped into the fort who should he behold with open arms but dr juno the scene was a grand and impressive one they embraced each other and wept for joy and the soldiers of both armies who beheld them also shed tears like little children even half intoxicated men seemed to realize that a holier element was going to rule and that scene of carnage was changed into a peaceful audience chamber but the battle still raged most furiously in other quarters men falling like drops of rain in a furious thunder shower however the news soon spread that fort principal was taken and that dr juno was alive which caused an instant surrender of the entire union or conspirators army general orthod surrendered his sword to dr juno they being the chief commanders of both armies the general said to dr juno as he handed his sword to him dr juno i cheerfully surrender my sword to you and hope that we may never more have need to take it up my best wishes are for the advancement of your cause i have never understood you until you made that bold and noble speech before the court-martial of which i was president and if you will permit me i will state that myself and my excellent associate here general longhead favored your acquittal which act almost cost us our lives the more rabid and inexperienced officers that were members of that court-martial overruled us but they are every one dead now having been lynched and shot by the mob by the working people who saw in you their saviour and my sympathies were and forever shall be with you and your cause applause with these intrusive remarks i submit myself to your charge and pray to be accepted as a brother naturalist tremendous applause and hurrahs fairly rend the firmament overhead dr juno modestly received the general's sword and said tremulously having been perfectly overcome with joyful emotions this act of yours alone is sufficient joy sobs and tears caused silence for a few minutes i say your generous sympathy overwhelms me with joy and gratitude you sir upon whom i have always looked as having been one of the greatest generals and statesmen that america has ever produced are doing reverence to me and are ready to join our beloved order of naturalists this truly is a conquest of which i am proud and i thank god and my followers for this victory for now little remains to be done to finish the work of reformation because the camel's back is broken and the country will freely receive its new habiliments which will bring good will to men a thing that must be desirable to all rational minds general orthod i hail the hour and worship the power that gave you into our hands 
and brought our hearts to beat in unison on the religion of the lord of hosts the blessed naturalist jesus christ is our exemplar and guardian whose sympathies always were with the poor the fallen and needy people i represent him to the best of my ability and i hope that the millennium is not far distant amen to all you have said generous brother responded the general when quite a tumult was caused without the guards miss lucinda armington the female general had arrived and desired to see dr juno which produced tremendous cheering and deafening applause end of chapter ninety two chapter ninety three of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety three pathetic meeting of victor and lucinda after the battle the interview between victor and lucinda was what shall i say heart-rending or heart-bleeding in sooth thousands stood with quivering lips and tearful eyes remember this was not by any means a common meeting of common lovers but when we reflect upon the numerous privations sufferings and anxieties that these two lovers of god lovers of humanity and lovers of each other were compelled to go through and at the close of these perilous adventures they meet again safe and sound it was really a touching scene very few who have lived in affluence or who led reckless lives could appreciate the impulses that moved these lovers and their spectators the latter had suffered in battle had experienced the hands of the haughty lucre king the power of the inhuman tyrant and the misery that poverty and want caused in a land where so to speak milk and honey should abundantly flow unto all the children of earth alike when dr juno heard that the people were exclaiming general lucinda hurrah for general lucinda hurrah 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 he asked what this all meant for he was not yet aware that his beloved affianced wife had taken his place in the field of battle and after general armington briefly told him he cried aloud make way for my affianced wife then the people parted to permit the happy couple to meet dr juno stood like marble with open arms and exclaimed when she flew into his arms my beloved my guardian angel silence and throbbing of hearts spoke the balance until the lovers regained their equilibrium when dr juno raised his head and said friends pardon a weak man's overflowing soul which is an evidence of the love he bears for a good and true woman such as this one my lucinda is when he repeated the last part of his sentence he had his right arm around her waist whilst he held her right hand in his left and gazed most lovingly into her upraised eyes which made a picture that was almost celestial to behold he now conducted her into an open coach and generals armington and orthod joined the couple when they were driven through the immense crowd of the soldiers of both armies besides citizens who cheered vociferously many rending their garments throwing their hats into the air and many novel expressions were made that indicated joy however several persons expressed themselves as displeased who were literally torn into atoms by the infuriated concourse of working people the people had learned for the first time that they were the sovereigns of america and they recognized dr juno as the man who brought about this great reform and they vowed to heed his counsel in all time to come as he was the only man who thoroughly understood how to direct a sound government according to the new era after the four generals namely lucinda dr juno armington and orthod had been driven through the large concourse of spectators they went to the headquarters of general orthod where they had all their wants supplied for they were all hungry 
and dr juno had his old common army clothes on yet which looked none too clean and sound because he was taken prisoner in them was wearing them ever since and they were full of bullet holes which gave them a ragged aspect after he exchanged these war-worn rags for a new suit of black he appeared before his beloved lucinda and the happy couple had a great deal of news to relate that transpired since they last met dr juno told her how he defied the court-martial and lucinda said to him you are a most fearless hero it is a miracle how you have escaped but providence seems to favor us for which i pray and thank god without ceasing you are an angel replied he but i knew what i was doing when i defied them you know my precious darling i have always told you that i had unbounded confidence in the people and when i saw that the courthouse was crowded with spectators i felt secure because i knew that i would be able to make firm friends of nearly every one of them it was my speech that saved my life and won the battle so easily how so my love said she i cannot see that because they found you guilty and ordered you to be shot at ten o'clock this morning just so my angel but don't you see that the soldiers rebelled and would not shoot me and my speech caused a crowd to lynch every one of the court-martial that voted for my conviction responded he you are my great hero and i can only thank god for again being with you safe and sound said she they sat for several hours in deep conversation concerning the things with which the reader is familiar the war was now literally at an end and the officers and leaders of the conspirators made themselves very scarce not that they dreaded the naturalists so much but they feared their own people more who were just beginning to find out how they had been humbugged for so many many years by the false representations that were made by the conspirators these orthodox conspirators had always represented dr juno as one of the worst lewd low criminal men living whilst the shoe was on the other foot he was the very man who ought to have been brought forward by these professed saints who took upon themselves to guard the welfare of the nation when it is being proved by unimpeachable testimony that they were the very ones who bankrupted body soul spirit church state and finance their house was founded upon the sand and the rain of shot and shell and the storm that the working people have produced caused their infamous temple to fall and great was the fall of it dr juno published a brief order stating that his generals would attend to the disposal of the armies that were at that place whilst he would journey east and when home in philadelphia he would issue his proclamation of peace he took two regiments of picked naturalists as an escort with him but he had something else in his mind's eye besides escort which was to settle the long-standing account with the lucre tyrants and sanctimonious demons who had persecuted and robbed him of all his rights for years the axe shortly fell upon the necks of the guilty parties as will be seen as we pass on end of chapter ninety three chapter ninety four of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety four dr juno's astounding peace proclamation to all the people of the united states of america the naturalists and working people have gained the victory over the orthodox community which will cause an entire change in this era of christian reformation it behooves me therefore to issue this my proclamation of peace firstly the enemy has surrendered his entire army and navy and thus the war is ended and i pray that a permanent peace may speedily come 
but this cannot be until every man and woman has complied with the demands which an outraged fixed law and an unchangeable creator require and therefore i proclaim and command that all the wealth in the land shall be placed into the treasury of the naturalists all persons must deposit all their money and valuables in the treasury for which they will receive deeds and after the new constitution is drawn up they will learn the workings of the new christian government this is peremptory and failure to comply is death secondly as money worshipping has been the great sin and ruination of nations and as the owners of filthy lucre or its equivalent are compelled to give it all to the treasury out of which they will be supplied with things as they have need of and as these owners of valuables have sinned by so professing what is for the good of all so likewise you the poor people have sinned by indulging in unhealthy habits such as rum tobacco medicines profanity licentiousness and so forth therefore you are equally compelled to give up your sinning or die the debauched however will soon die from disease famine and pestilence will wipe them away which may save us the annoyance of shooting them if stubborn and rebellious thirdly all the public buildings will hastily be turned into institutions of instruction wherein the weak-minded ones will be placed and so treated and cared for as to give them sound sensibilities each person must now earn his or her food by the sweat of the brow idleness shall be a felony and determined and persistent stubbornness and rebellion against the new order of things shall be punished by shooting the miscreant obedience and submission to fixed law or death is the edict and i shall have this executed with as little compunction as i had when i shot the prisoners fourthly let all comprehend that the old order of things is no more from the president of the united states down to the smallest public officer they have all been removed with the close of the war and must now be esteemed as working people each man woman and youth must do his or her share of work which will be simply two or three hours daily recreation that is necessary for the development and preservation of a sound mind in a sound body fifthly the people at large have learned through this war that the naturalists soldiers were healed without medicines therefore they may know that the christian manner of healing the sick is the only right one hence medicines fashions and all artificial and useless things must be abolished instantly the only fashion admissible shall be to learn and obey the fixed injunctions of the creator and grow and remain natural sixthly self and selfishness for mere isolated gratification shall be treated as a virulent disease and such invalids must instantly be placed into the institutions of instruction until healed or remain there for life i do not wish to be understood that you should not take care of yourself this you must do no one can do it for you but you shall not be jealous overbearing and hold usable things for yourself alone seventhly the deacons of the secret order of naturalists understand all about the new order of government and they are hereby authorized all over the union to carry out our plans foreigners who may arrive on our shores must enter the institutions of instruction before they can live in the united states and sojourners from abroad must comply with the new order of things to the letter or they will be imprisoned in the institutions of instruction they are positively forbidden to introduce or themselves use on our soil any agencies or put themselves under influences that are prohibited by this proclamation and the new constitution eighthly upon these conditions alone can peace come to the hearth and homes of the people of the united states further no one shall be permitted under the penalty of death to destroy or remove valuables from the united states i argue that as long as this nation did not know how to take care of itself it is necessary that it be taken care of by reinforcing god's fixed laws 
which shall be esteemed as monarch and individuals shall only be permitted to be free and do as they please so long as they please to do right which right is alone found to exist in leading natural godly christ-like lives ninthly those who do not understand how to act will be esteemed good citizens by instantly applying for information to any of the secret order of naturalists which are everywhere in operation but which were not known heretofore however they will from this day display their banners and open their doors for giving information tenthly provisions clothing tenements and all necessary things shall from this day be supplied to each as they need and no one shall usurp more than his or her necessities demand under the penalty of being imprisoned in the institutions of instruction those who voluntarily apply for admission into said institutions of instruction shall be permitted to leave when they please but those who are placed forcibly therein shall be esteemed as prisoners who cannot leave until their cases are investigated and are granted permission to leave persons escaping from the institutions of instruction who were prisoners shall be punished by death in conclusion i can but say that we shall prevent diseases and sins by rigid punishment of those who violate god's fixed laws when fewer will suffer and die except of old age than by the barbarous old orthodox manner where every one was free to violate god's law and if that violator was mean and selfish enough to hoard up lucre could thereby create unnatural statute laws build prisons and inflict insult upon injury and all this to the subversion of the whole race of mankind all the newspapers shall publish this proclamation and shall cease to be published by any one except selected naturalists given this blank day of blank nineteen blank by victor juno n b be it known to all men that god is a dictator and we who are his faithful children must likewise dictate to those who are in bondage to fashions follies vices and profligacies but i hope and pray that the day is not far distant when every rational creature shall worship god by voluntary obedience to his unalterable mandates when indeed the millennium will be established a new eden be created where pristine beauty and innocence will reign supreme and love to god and man become the only statute of the earth v j end of chapter 94chapter ninety five of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety five dr juno with his picked soldiers brands the pharisees it is a long lane that has no turn and whilst the proprietors of the daily philadelphia newspapers have had everything their own way for many years having maliciously libelled dr juno and shut him out of the advertising columns of these public organs to which all citizens have a right in other words they might as well have gone to his safe and robbed it as to rob him of the right of advertising his lawful business whilst they could continually publish lies of the vilest character about him but at last the tables were turned again the young men's association had him arrested and cast into prison whilst those who were dependent upon him suffered agony the judges and ring officials all chimed in with the newspaper and sabbatarian conspirators hence he arrested every one of these people male and female and had them imprisoned in the same prison where they had him incarcerated years before and as the tables were now being completely turned he considered it his duty to disgrace them for their deep-dyed hypocrisy and low conduct therefore he did not shoot them but after retaining them in prison for several months until he had drawn up and published the new constitution 
he took them out into the large park and in the presence of the multitude branded them on their foreheads in the following words bloody conspirator shun him like a reptile or die dr juno previous to indelibly branding these vipers made the following speech to the people after forming a large circle by his soldiers the vipers standing in a group in the centre and the speaker in front of them on an elevated platform friends and fellow-citizens i do not glory in the downfall of a sinner or of an enemy but when we study god and his wonderful works and fixed laws we can readily ascertain what is our duty even though that duty may not be a pleasantry i would much rather see a sinner and an enemy repent and turn from error to right than punish him myself however god punishes all transgressors and if we are his children and are commanded to have dominion over the things of earth we are compelled to punish those who would if they could lead the innocent and unsuspecting into the broad road to hell it becomes us to exhort a straying fellow-creature first but if he is haughty and self-righteous in his course of sinfulness then it becomes our christian duty or call it a natural duty if you prefer that expression to punish or disgrace such scribe pharisee and hypocrite here you behold a group of men and women to whom i have appealed for years in the strongest language possible to repent of their degrading and haughty sinfulness but they spurned the law of god and the cause of mankind which i have laid before them they have robbed us all of that knowledge and those means by which the people might have regained their natural godly christ-like state long ago they have despised the working people applause whilst they have used every cunning device to rob them of their hard-earned money and in the lofty guise of being charitable they gave thousands of dollars publicly of the people's lucre to their so-called charitable institutions to show unto men that they gave alms liberally and with this flourish of trumpets they advertised themselves in the most heinous manner and thereby shut up your eyes when they could with impunity steal millions of your hard-earned money thus they have made themselves lords of creation by robbing you and elevating themselves to moses's seat when they were the very vipers whom jesus of nazareth hath denounced with the utmost terrible curses tremendous applause these vipers have not shown any sign of penitence and if they had it now in their power as they have had for nearly a quarter of a century they would do the same acts and glory in being the chosen elite whilst the greasy mechanic who is not good enough to wipe their fine feet upon as the honourable bluster gibbon said in his speech before the court in which i was tried and convicted vociferous applause look at them now what a scared set of forlorn and crime distinguished set of sinners they are when shown up to the illiterate coarse dirty working people enthusiastic applause should we pity them does god pity such arch fiends when he sends them to their own orthodox hell which they have pictured and laid out for you for your special benefit if you do not fall down and wince like curs and give them your everything and worship them for being so generous charitable and good as to give to the poor thousands their giving has only been a sham a public bait an antichrist manner of giving alms yet these wretches usurped the name of saints of being the chosen people because they were wicked apt shrewd and niggardly enough to hoodwink you terrific applause you who were good enough to pay the taxes which they saddled upon you whilst they made you believe that they indeed they paid the heavy taxes cannot you now see with half sound senses that these monsters were your worst enemies the enemies of god the mockers of jesus christ see the fifth sixth seventh tenth and twenty-third chapters of st matthew in the new testament and the degenerators and murderers of pure innocent defenceless little children yes they teach doctrines so unnatural and heinous that cause the birth of innocence by haphazard 
who inherit hereditary and congenital diatheses from the unhealthy state of the parents, and when millions of sickly little lambs are called to life, who should not have seen the light of day, they dose and drug them, and in one thousand and one ways infringe upon God's fixed laws, and plaster it all over by prayers and rhapsodical speeches made by their canting preachers. The applause at this point was deafening, and continued for minutes. It would be too great a charity to send these most wicked wretches to their long account, so I propose to brand them indelibly on their foreheads and cheeks with this instrument, which I had prepared for all such sinners, and I shall order the execution of its decree. This shall be esteemed an everlasting and the greatest disgrace that can befall a creature. The decree is this, bloody conspirator, shun him like a reptile, or die. Should, in course of time, any of these wretches prove worthy to have this stigma removed, I will cause a countersign, which, when planted across this, will redeem them from the odium that this brands them with, when they shall be looked upon as working people. In conclusion, let all take warning how they disregard the voice of God and the naturalists, and with heartfelt sympathy for each, according to the deeds done in past days, I now order the officers to brand each one of these persons on this elevated stand, so that all may see the work executed. Great applause. The bald eagle proprietor of the oracle was the first man who had the dose administered. He looked sheepish enough, and some of the spectators cried aloud, Dob him on his bald head! Give him a double dose! There is sufficient room on that glossy and hardened scalp! These remarks caused immense mirth, which seemed to be a hard pill to take for the fellow who had lived like a nabob in a one hundred thousand dollar castle, every cent of which was wrung out of the working people's pockets. When they were all branded, Dr. Juno entered again upon the stand, and said, I order that these people will be taken back to prison, and kept there until I see how the new order of things works. They were now marched to Moya Mensing, the band following in their rear, playing The Rogue's March. End of chapter 95 Chapter 96 of The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 96. Disposal of Nancy Clover and Company, and Preparation for the Marriage of Victor and Lucinda. It will be remembered that Dr. Juno and Miss Lucinda Armington's wedding has been three times interrupted. The last time, Nancy Clover shot Dr. Juno just as the minister was about to pronounce the ceremony, and in sooth, it was each time the work of the bloody conspirators. Therefore, to make sure of it this time, Dr. Juno had Nancy Clover, Deacon Rob Stew, Dr. Toy Paney, and the physician-in-chief of the insane asylum hunted up and brought before him for trial. Several of them were under heavy bonds when the war broke out, but of course nothing could be done then. However, now came the hour of their discontent. The Reverend Joe Peer was formerly one of the associates of these leading conspirators, but he was not a bad man at heart. Circumstances, associations, and the want of money to supply his material wants drove him into this work of the devil, and it is known to the reader that he repented and turned a naturalist the first opportunity that convinced him of a surety of protection from these bloody conspirators. When Dr. Juno had found the aforementioned persons, he ordered their imprisonment until he could summon all the victims of these sweet saints who proved to consist of General Harry Gossamer, Miss Lucinda Armington, and father, Pat O'Connor, Judy McRae, Jemmy, Mr. Grumbler, Reverend Joe Peer, and Dr. Juno himself. The day of trial was appointed, 
dr victor juno acting as judge and when the holy elect nancy clover deacon rob stew dr toy paney and the physician-in-chief were arraigned they were thunderstruck to behold harry gossamer the lovely sister nancy clover fainted dead away when she was brought face to face with harry gossamer and deacon rob stew stood with eyes and mouth wide open looking as if he really thought the spirit or ghost of the drowned harry gossamer stood before him so also thought nancy clover who fainted three times in succession the two physicians had more nerve therefore could bear the sight of their victim when these elect sinners were restored to their senses dr juno said nancy clover rob stew toy paney and physician of the insane asylum stand up you are charged with conspiracy murder and crime of all characters what say you guilty or not guilty not guilty responded each one of them the witnesses were now regularly examined and cross-examined by counsels on both sides the testimony of general gossamer and rev joe peer was soul-stirring but the rest was less to the point although general armington and his daughter lucinda exposed some deep villainy with which the reader is already familiar general harry gossamer sworn dr juno general gossamer do you know the prisoners at the bar answer yes sir to my sorrow and to their disgrace question please state what you consider a few of the worst things that you know of them answer i became a member of what was known to its members only as the sacredly secret conclave in the month of january eighteen blank mr rob stew and nancy clover were the leading conspirators all the members had to take a terrible iron-clad oath which was known as the solemn oath the reader is familiar with it the object of this sacredly secret conclave was to banish or murder everybody who would oppose the peculiar old school or orthodox religion they styled themselves the elect and as such could not sin but claimed to have a perfect license to persecute everybody who entertained different views to them this conclave was nothing more or less than a bloody conspiracy and was inaugurated for the special purpose of murdering our father here dr juno i know this because on a certain meeting night when all the prisoners were present and cooperated i was constrained to object to a certain murdering plot when this deacon stew instantly ordered my arrest and i was at once cast into a dungeon and the same evening was convicted without being present at the mock trial and after they had concluded the same what happened the rev joe peer can tell you who was then their president i was ordered before them when the president read me a lecture and sentenced me to be drowned or hung for my audacity in refusing to countenance the murder of victor juno the honorable judge upon the bench i was taken to the river and was drowned as they thought but the noble pat o'connor saved my life and i am here safe and sound the reader knows particulars cross-examine counsel for defendants mr gossamer are you certain that every one of the prisoners was present and countenanced what you have related answer i am most positive question have you not been insane some years ago and is this not one of your peculiar imaginings answer better let rev joe peer and pat o'connor answer if they are peculiar imaginings counsel for defendants that will do that will do rev joe peer sworn dr juno mr peer give us briefly what you know of the prisoners at the bar and also state if what general gossamer said is false or true answer it is scarcely necessary for me to make a long statement concerning the motives and acts of the sacredly secret conclave it is only necessary for me to say that every word that general harry gossamer has said is true and a thousand worse things have i been compelled to hear and see and rob stew invariably threatened me with a horrible death should i fail to carry out and enforce his heinous work he and nancy clover have been too domineering and wicked whilst these two doctors were always ready to execute their nefarious commands 
all that mr stew and miss clover had to do was to propose a criminal plot when these prisoners were ready to act thus was dr juno to be poisoned on several occasions and the villainies which they continually concocted were legion cross-examine counsel for defendants mr peer did you not act in concert with the prisoners at the bar in the legion of villainies and are you guileless in having concocted any criminal plots answer i am not on trial but if it is any gratification to you or your clients i will say that from fear of being assassinated by them or being discovered and overpowered by others i did connive with them and did also my best to invent anything to save myself from being sent hence with all my sins upon my head but the first opportunity i had i repented and joined the naturalists and our heroic father dr juno has several times offered the same opportunity and privilege to the prisoners at the bar but they spurned his beneficent overtures i hope however that he will yet permit your clients to repent and if he does i pray them to accept the hour of grace counsel for defendants i did not ask you to preach a sermon to my clients answer but you cannot say that they don't need it and it would not be the first one nor the first time that i gave them good advice which however they always spurned counsel for defendants i have no objections should my clients wish to repent and join the naturalists for i am myself an advocate of nature and nature's god dr juno i am willing and ready to hear from the prisoners themselves on this topic and if they are heartily penitent i may require only probationary training in the west philadelphia institution of instruction rob stew said i spurn any such propositions i am no coward and i will die by my faith ditto ejaculated nancy clover the two physicians remained silent after all the witnesses were heard dr juno said to the members of the naturalists who were all inside of the circle made for them brothers how say you are these prisoners at the bar guilty all who feel that way will rise to their feet they all arose when dr juno said in a firm voice friends you behold before you my worst persecutors a parcel of satan's own band who are hardened beyond expression they deserve death without mercy but as war is over and as we can make excellent use of them i order that they be branded with our disgracing motto on their foreheads cheeks arms legs feet trunk and each one have the letters b and c cut through their ears after this is done they shall all four be imprisoned for life in one room unless i pardon them where they shall work four hours a day and be kept as a free show to all the world when these prisoners were removed from free soil dr juno and miss armington appointed the day for the long and often postponed nuptials this time nothing marred the consummation of the pleasing function End of chapter ninety six chapter ninety seven of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety seven the wedding on friday which was always the lucky day of dr juno the fourth day of blank nineteen blank was set apart for the wedding day of victor and lucinda and all the naturalists or working people hereafter the naturalists and working people mean the same were invited but no others were permitted to be present this was done as a precautionary measure because dr juno had learned to guard himself more closely than of yore moreover just then there were many unconverted persons living everywhere who would have delighted to molest or kill either him or his betrothed wife many people were of the opinion that this would be a grand carnival because money was plenty with both general armington and dr juno but this was not the case 
nothing unnatural or unnecessary was done or presented still every one was made happy and satisfied by the cordial welcome that all received at the hands of their hosts the best and plenty of healthy food was ready at all hours and everything that was pleasing and enjoyable to a natural person was to be had but no artificial beverages no gross dishes neither tobacco was seen there in sooth these things were not craved by the naturalists and although some of the new members of the novel order of things had been but recently inveterate habitual indulgers in riotous living using tobacco rum condiments and so forth but the famous teachings of dr juno and the peremptory orders to the people to desist totally from the use of such things inspired them with higher joys and loftier ambitions than tippling gluttony and money-getting the idea of getting money to purchase imaginary wants unhealthy agencies and which cause diseases had already been exchanged for the love to god and mankind and the guests at this wedding saw that to live for one another for love and to be treated as if they were all one family was an incentive of greater power than orthodoxy could furnish it seemed on this occasion as though every one was inspired with the holy ghost they had the example set them by their father and it was to be mother dr juno and miss armington they all loved and respected the happy couple for their great achievements and when they saw that these heroic reformers lived to make all mankind sound and happy they praised god from the abundance of their hearts to think that the spirit of righteousness the spirit of christ and spirit of god dwelled in the leaders of this new era truly the millennium dawn and the second appearing of christ were being made manifest all were happy in the spirit all felt joy in the gratification of the thinking faculties which gave them power to control the lower propensities and they were in one place with one accord verily the doctrines of christ seemed to have become natural and nothing was craved but the desire to make each other happy this was a delightful state of affairs and it only went to prove that it was as easy to do right under physiological or natural circumstances as it is to do wrong under artificial and diseased circumstances under the unphysiological orthodox circumstances swearing came naturally to young and old without requiring public private or sunday schools whilst under the genuine christ-like or natural circumstances praises and intuitive prayers came naturally and eloquent inspiration from the fountainhead of jehovah teaches all to speak as with cloven tongues that which is necessary to be spoken the hour had arrived for the nuptial ceremony to be performed the minister announced it and all arose to their feet and with reverence listened to the eloquent words of the progressive apostle as he spoke as follows dearly beloved in the lord it hath again pleased the lord of hosts to permit us to meet together in peace and spiritual communion and although our beloved hosts have gone through many fires yet have they ever been guided by the infallible hand of god whose fixed laws are always a safe guide to the people of his heritage we have gathered together on this delightful occasion to join this man and woman in holy matrimony which is commanded by the highest ordinance of the creator but it is not a function that should be lightly or unadvisedly entered but reverently discreetly soberly and physiologically in the fear of committing new sins provided the applicants for these holy orders were not fitted physically and mentally to propagate their kind in the image of god if any man can show any defect in either this man or woman or just cause why they may not be lawfully joined together let him now speak or else hereafter hold his peace victor juno wilt thou have this woman to be thy wedded wife to live together so long as ye both shall live i will responded victor lucinda armington wilt thou have this man to be thy wedded husband to live together so long as ye both shall live i will responded lucinda 
inasmuch as it has pleased almighty god to grant unto this man and woman the talent the health and the understanding of his fixed laws and inasmuch as this man and woman have come here to be joined together for pure love for each other as man and wife i now pronounce the holy ordinance what therefore god hath joined together let no man put asunder let us all pray father of mercies and giver of all necessary things we praise thy hallowed name for having made us in thine own blessed image we worship thee by obedience to thy fixed mandates and we glorify thy name for the munificent gifts that heaven and earth bestow upon thy faithful children and o lord we thank thee for having given us this man and woman as exemplars for thy people may they live long on thy footstool and bless the nations with that knowledge of thy kingdom which surpasses all sinful understanding and to thee be all the power and glory for ever amen at this point pat o'connor and judy mccrae came modestly forward hand in hand and pat said may it please your reverence to do they same to us this caused a laugh throughout the assemblage but the minister obeyed the solicitation and pat and judy were equally happy thus ended the nuptials of two faithful people and victor and lucinda seemed to have a brilliant crown of glory surrounding their heads the happy couple were now taken by the hand by all present and were congratulated with all sorts of expressions from the most eloquent eulogies to silent tears the latter spoke with double emphasis indeed all things seemed to work together for good because all loved the lord in a practical manner and a crown of glory awaited every man and woman in the large assemblage the guests had commenced to congregate at nine o'clock in the morning the ceremony was performed at twelve at noon and they left at five in the afternoon which was all in keeping with the new order of things and which made it a day of thanksgiving thanks that came from the heart and not vain lip service whilst the mind was unconcerned as it is in pharisaical circles happiness the aim and end of man seemed to smile upon dr juno but all was not permanently serene yet End of chapter 97chapter ninety eight of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety eight famine and pestilence come to the aid of the naturalists it may be easily imagined that thousands of hardened lost men and women lived at that day when the supremacy of nature's laws were in the ascendant and although these people feared dr juno worse than satan still they could not yield in their determination to pursue their own downward course famine first came and pestilence next to aid the cause of reform by destroying those who led dissipated lives who were stimulated and enervated by the orthodox habits these people died like flies and as they would not accept the reformed hygienic treatment but persist in employing stealthily the poison practices of medical science they passed away so speedily that not a remnant scarcely was left of them after the pestilence raged a month hence the path for the naturalists was cleared of all its deteriorating rubbish and the work of god and man went exultingly along it may seem very curious to orthodox minds why it was that famine and pestilence should make their appearance just in the nick of time to aid the reformation some may ask did god suspend any of his fixed laws for the benefit of the naturalists and thereby send famine and pestilence we answer no but the earth has been stimulated for centuries has been forced by artificial means the same as the orthodox people and at last could no more produce food nor give pure air to its inhabitants 
who instead of holding dominion over everything ran riot thus were poisonous gases continually generated until both earth atmosphere and man became so depraved as to cause rebellion in the spirit of each hence war famine and pestilence are brothers and they are caused by violations of god's fixed laws whilst the penalty is a natural result instead of a suspension of his immutable mandates immediately after dr juno was married and as soon as he had published his new constitution to the world the earth ceased to produce food for man or beast and nearly two years of famine and starvation existed the naturalists who live not by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god had of course the advantage over the remaining portion of the orthodox people who would not be converted in due season the former who were grown up suffered very little for the want of food because they were comforted by the clear understanding that this scarcity of food was to be their salvation but the poor little children whose systems were growing and whose hunger therefore was very great suffered awfully many cases were heart-rending in the extreme we give a few examples as illustrations how these little angels suffered all over the globe the naturalists children suffered less than the orthodox in the new england states you could hear little children cry for bread oh dear mamma give me some bread oh i am so hungry i cannot live please oh please give me some bread mothers and fathers would eat the poorest quality and smallest quantity of what little they could procure and give the best to their children a wealthy farmer who had joined the naturalists had a large family of little children the oldest was a son of twelve summers one morning they all sat around their table which contained nothing except mouldy bread these children until now always had plenty and when the son of twelve saw the mouldy piece of bread lie on his plate he looked at his father disdainfully and said father i hope you do not expect me to eat this stale and mouldy bread when his father seemed to turn pale and flushed alternately which surprised the boy when the parent lifted his piece of bread and said my son i have cut you and my dear babies the best of all we have look how mouldy and spoiled my piece is this brought great tears into the boy's eyes and he said sobbing father forgive me i did not know that we had no better i am satisfied all seemed to enjoy their mouldy bread after this conversation except the father who seemed to have lost his appetite entirely and when the smallest children mere babies had eaten their portion and saw that some was left by their father one asked papa don't you want dat bed no my beloved babies was his reply then give to benny and i said a little girl the father could not resist but gave the sour mouldy bread to them when they devoured it with a gusto that caused the older boy to weep as if his little heart would break and the parents were compelled to leave the scene flour and bread were saved so long as to cause them to grow mouldy the naturalists could live on very little compared with the orthodox people and the latter cared little what quality of stuff they swallowed so long as it filled their stomachs and appeased their hunger but whilst they feasted rather better than the naturalists during the famine they were being made terrible victims for the jaws of the pestilence a thing they did not expect nor did they understand these matters any more than they ever did hence it only proved again that orthodoxy and self-defiling were synonymous and when the hour of accountability for the deeds done in the body and to the body came these people fell dead by the thousands whilst the naturalists understood that as the quality of food is that you swallow so also is the quality of the body textures therefore they lived on a very little of pure food and had nothing therefore inside of them that could easily decay whilst the orthodox people were filled with gross agencies hash and drugs from crown to toe which ignited instantly when the miasmic effluvia touched their vitals 
and the combustion under these circumstances was so great that instant extinction of life was certain dr juno issued a proclamation of warning to those who had lived reckless orthodox lives as follows the moment that the looked-for pestilence made its appearance proclamation to those of the people who did not heed the many warnings that i gave them for many years i proclaim an order that they will at once flee to the mountains and subsist upon the plainest food that they can procure and those who will not or cannot do so if they are taken with the pestilence must expect to be burned up in their houses for we shall remove the valuables from the cities where the plague exists and set the cities on fire which will burn out the miasma and aid in creating rain which will bring the elixir of life with it in the shape of oxygen in time of war famine and pestilence it cannot be expected that the guilty ones alone shall be made to suffer therefore if there are any innocent ones who are unfavorably situated we advise them to observe this proclamation and flee from the wrath to come and if such are penitent we shall exert ourselves to save them otherwise we cannot aid them having enough to do to take care of ourselves and to stop the plague from spreading more and more given this twentieth day of blank nineteen blank by victor juno this plague exceeded everything in its extent of destruction of human life that was ever known or heard of hundreds of thousands fell dead daily which so horrified the balance of the orthodox and rebellious worldlings that they were anxious to become naturalists as they saw that very few of the latter died and the few who did die with it were those who had only recently turned reformers and whose bodies had not yet had time to be remodeled sufficiently to bear the brunt of so great a pestilence the dead bodies were ordered to be burned and thousands who were lying on their deathbeds were consumed by the burning of the various cities which seemed a visitation too horrible to be anticipated but what could be done besides this course drug doctors fell dead in hundreds and they seemed to know nothing about the disease in fact they do not and never did understand the true nature and causes of diseases or they would not poison a person just because he had been ill through one or more violations of god's laws of health thereby adding insult to injury however these hypothetical vipers dared in past ages to assume the attitude of the regular standard lights of healing of the sick when every step in life's great battle proved them charlatans and stuck up and opinionated impostors if what is here asserted be not true then are jesus christ and nature false doctors but the fiat has gone forth and these quacks have died and vanished by their own achievements therefore peace to their ashes but a warning to all generations to come end of chapter ninety eight chapter ninety nine of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter ninety nine the new constitution we who understand the fixed laws of the creator hereby form the following constitution which shall be the supreme and only law of the land section one we recognize the unalterable fixed laws of nature and wonderful natural works of god as the sovereign power of heaven and earth and love to god and man are the fruition of obedience to the same section two we regard the acts of jesus christ as worthy of imitation and no citizen of these united states of america shall profess or claim to be a christian or naturalist unless he leads as near as possible the natural life that christ led and the fifth sixth seventh tenth and twenty-third chapters of st matthew of the new testament shall be learned and their teachings become the principles by which all things shall be compared 
and upon which everything is to be based. Section 3. All anti-natural and anti-Christ customs, statutes, and precepts shall be treated as felonious. Fashions and all useless or unnecessary things and customs shall also be treated as criminal, and the victim shall be imprisoned in the institutions of instruction. Section 4. Individuals shall not own property of any kind, but each shall receive the necessaries of life as he or she has need of, in common with the rest, and in keeping with the laws of nature and capacity of the means of the country. Section 5. The apt, zealous, and faithful disciples shall become the apostles, who will make proper scientific interpretations of the fixed laws of God. The people who will not voluntarily learn the right and obey it shall be made to do so, as schoolboys of yore were compelled to do. Section 6. The oldest, ablest, and most faithful apostle shall be esteemed an infallible interpreter of the fixed laws of the Church of God, but if found wanting, shall be deposed. Section 7. Dr. Victor Juno's sermons, teachings, proclamations, and army orders shall be the standard for all generations, because they are sound beyond cavil. Section 8. That there shall be no public opinion, but knowledge of all the essentials pertaining to human affairs shall banish opinion. Opinions shall not be tolerated in matters where science or fixed law exists. Beliefs, conjectures, and hypotheses on matters of human affairs shall not be allowed to be advanced and promulgated in public or private. Section 9. The printing press shall only be open to those who understand God's fixed laws, who are authorized to use it for his kingdom, and to print or publish anything that is erroneous, false, useless, or in conflict with the infallible laws of nature or nature's God, shall be esteemed treason toward high heaven, and the penalty for the first offense shall be imprisonment in the institutions of instruction, and for any future violation of this section shall be death. The so-called free printing press has proved the most dangerous vehicle to debauch the people. Therefore, the heaviest penalty shall be attached to the misuse of it. Section 10. Little children shall be cared for as if they constituted the angels in heaven, no matter who are their parents, or whether they inherited good or bad constitutions. But parents who generate human souls under unphysiological circumstances, and bring sickness, deformity, and so forth upon their offspring, shall at once be imprisoned in the separate department for the sexes of the institutions of instruction, and marriages shall not be allowed except from love and when in a natural state. The head of the church will further direct these matters in keeping with the body and blood of Christ. Section 11. All who fail to comprehend and do not live out the teachings of our king, fixed law, shall be imprisoned in what shall be known as the institutions of instruction, which institutions shall be conducted upon natural principles, as set forth in Dr. Victor Juno's Great Proclamation of Peace, section 3rd. But we hope the time will speedily come when no such institutions will be needed. Section 12. The orthodox method of educating the young and old shall be totally abandoned, and obedience to the fixed laws of growth and development of body and soul shall be the only schooling, when intuition or the Holy Spirit will teach all they ever need know, but so to raise and train both young and old as to become the purified temples of God, the apostles and naturalists who are grown up shall have books wherein the fixed laws are explained. Section 13. The Bible shall only be in the hands of the apostles, who can scientifically interpret the meaning of the authors, and obsolete biblical history, like every other history, shall be abandoned. Section 14. Conversation for recreation, mirth, and mere pastime shall not be restricted, so long as blasphemy and profanity are omitted. But when it is given as instruction or advice, a heavy penalty shall be attached to false doctrines. 
in fact the latter shall not be tolerated under any pretext by pen tongue printer's ink or in any other manner section fifteen to speak evil of any one or to herald evil or to show forth evil of any kind shall be esteemed the highest crime amongst men and shall be punished as in section nine of this constitution section sixteen hypocrisy and deception shall be esteemed the highest crime against god and man and if any person indulges in them or if any individual knows persons who practise them and does not inform on the hypocrites they shall all be counted guilty of felony the hypocrite and shielder of the deceiver and shall be punished as in section nine of this constitution section seventeen all municipal laws and ordinances made by mankind shall be in harmony with the fixed natural laws of god and love to god and man shall be the highest law of earth End of chapter ninety nine chapter one hundred of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter one hundred dawn of the millennium war famine and pestilence having wiped away the impure advocates of the devil's kingdom and the deteriorators and dissipators of humanity having died whilst dr juno's indefatigable acts war proclamations orders and so forth have compelled the balance to obey god's holy laws which are for the joy and everlasting glory of all rational creatures alike so now an entire new era has been established and those who live live to let live live for health for one another for happiness for glory to god and mankind thus the second advent of christ is everywhere manifest a new eden is established the image of god is enthroned one continual sabbath day is celebrated the dressing of the garden of perpetual peace and innocence is the legitimate work of each man and woman god is praised without ceasing love is as free as the mountain air and is ushered forth toward god and man from the abundance of the heart or depth of the soul the year of jubilee has come peace and good will to god and man reign supreme and on high his will is done here in earth as it is in heaven dr juno and his beloved wife lucinda sit regally clad in the habiliments of heavenly glory upon the throne of grace they are the acknowledged victors and chief apostles of the naturalists who in company with the happy sons and daughters of victor and lucinda surround their father and mother whilst the grandfather general washington armington in the sere and yellow leaf daily asks blessings on the heads of all the children of earth and the old man fairly worships his noble son and daughter whilst the grandchildren dote on their blessed grandpapa words cease to express the joy the happiness and good will that reigns continually amongst all the people there is more than plenty of everything to supply all their natural real wants and also plenty of time daily for all to gather together for mutual sociability and intuitive thanksgiving to him who has made everything for the whole people's good every living mortal now sees the folly and sinfulness of the old barbarous orthodox customs and they praise dr juno and the almighty creator for having been brought into the light of the hallowed millennium the second coming of christ which means the second appearing of god's righteousness in the shape of obedience to his fixed laws is consummated in full power and heavenly grandeur and the immaculate and infallible spirit of christ or spirit of god's science of human life holds sovereign sway and masterdom which makes the earth a heaven and inspires the temple of god with holy fire and heavenly zeal baptizing all nations and peoples with power and grace divine foreign countries are being hastily baptized with the same exuberant blessings 
and a new heaven and a new earth have been established for the old having passed away to make way for the second coming of christ and the hosts of the new jerusalem are sounding their talismanic lyres with enchanting effect upon the minds of all the children of his footstool peace and good will are not one tithe the blessings that surround the human family but love to god and one another magnified by thrills from the holy spirit which enhances the pleasures and joys of earth so extensively that god's will has become the universal will of the people thus death is swallowed up in victory and all rejoice in the transmission from earth to mansions in the skies language fails to express the acknowledged munificence of god and the rapturous bliss that his unalloyed influence exercises over the purified temples of god is overwhelming which causes the human mind to quaff living water whose properties are exuberantly magically and divinely spiritualistic that thrill and enliven every avenue of the soul until the body becomes a normally toned instrument whereupon the spirit of god or holy spirit plays enchanting music that electrifies every atom of all animated creation now victor juno is blessed with everything that his great heart yearned for with everything that his muscles labored for with everything that his giant will struggled for with a congenial and heroic christian wife and mother by his side with children in god's blessed image surrounding him with all the people falling before the throne of grace and doing homage to god and man and all this for the love they bear for him for god and for one another this pays him ten million times for the pains deprivations persecutions and struggles through which he has compelled to go for the purpose of establishing this millennium dawn the spirit of jesus christ now holds sacred his manly body and soul and those who have exhausted their strength of body mind and purse to disgrace and persecute him have sunken into the depth of disgrace and have become fuel for the evil one to satiate his venom upon whilst a beloved victor and his people enjoy the gifts of an unchangeable creator and a mansion not made by human hands but eternal in the sky awaits the blessed naturalist whose greatness goodness and indomitable energy are indelibly inscribed upon the hearts of the entire race of mankind thus truly worthy have proved the operations of the noble and heroic son of toil who has lived and labored for the salvation of his race his reward is made manifest to the inhabitants of heaven and earth whilst he is the happy man End of chapter 100chapter 101 of the social war of 1900 or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jason in panama the social war of 1900 or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis moral i have written this novel with the intention of showing the danger of entrusting the government of church and state in the hands of theoretical speculators who carry on their trades or callings without opposition or without permitting open criticisms on their conduct and logic ministers of the sectarian denominations have thus grown impudent and hardened in their sanctimonious work who dare not be opposed with impunity and they claim a holy right to usurp every means good and ill to sustain their false positions which has been shown in their acts towards myself as partly portrayed in this story my trial and imprisonment for publishing a scientific physiological book and the several attempts to assassinate me also the newspaper libels and sectarian connivings as laid down in this novel are all truer than most of the preaching that we hear from the fashionable rostrums i have drawn a heavy picture on both sides however i am convinced that the protestant sectarian leaders if they were a unit as the roman catholics are would do worse deeds than are given in this story but instead of being a unit they have several hundred sects 
each hating the other, which may be the only benefit of the many sects. The hero of the plot, as well as the heroine, Victor and Lucinda, are two people after mine own heart, and I would do things precisely as they are portrayed by them if I had it in my power. Moreover, I hope all thinking people will appreciate the charity of dealing summarily with those who misrepresent God, nature, and Jesus Christ, and who by so doing have bankrupted everything until the immutable laws of the Creator are spurned, whilst the traditions of men receive respect at the sacrifice of millions of the human kind. The deacon is only a fair sample of what many of our self-righteous modern deacons are, only with this difference, that deacon Rob Stew is far more brave, heroic, and fearless than our modern bigots, who in their hearts feel like doing as deacon Stew did, but have neither the tact nor the courage to do so. I hope that I am not misunderstood in presenting the extreme views of good and evil, or the acme of heavenly zeal or demoniacal ambition. I love the genuine Christian and honest official, but despise the ways of the hypocrite and politician. All should be governed by the fixed law of God, and the good of the many should be sought at the sacrifice of the good of the few, which reverses the customs of the day. And until the aim and end of able men point in the direction that this novel sets forth, the broad road will be lined, whilst the narrow path will be deserted. My secret prayers are for the welfare of all, and my physical and mental energies shall be expended in the direction just spoken of, hoping that the millennium will dawn ere many years pass away. The Author End of Chapter 101 End of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers by Simon Landis